आ सकते और
Go for it. Let's go for it. Well, I think that when you talk about AIDS, the topic, it's not really the easiest thing to kind of bring up in a conversation. Um, it's kind of like whose turn is to pay for dinner. <laughs> so, I think there's we're still kind of molding it into people of, of our generation the relevance of it as opposed to that like teaching about it. Everybody knows about it. But knowing about it and being a part of it and doing something and educating your peers about it is a completely different thing. So I think that each year it gets better, but that's all that it can do is just get better. It can't get worse. We definitely see a difference. So, as far as my DC perspective, I've never actually traveled out anywhere. So. Um, from what I see with the World AIDS Day this year in Washington, DC, and just going to different events, I almost feel like we keep seeing the same people over and over again, and that we're not reaching the people that we should really be reaching to come out to these events and to really get involved. The people that are coming out to the events are the people that are already involved. <laughs> so if the same people keep coming out to the events, how do we reach out to that other group of people to, um, to get them motivated to take action and to come out and to really be involved and to see what we see and to make a change in the community in this field. So for World Days Day this year in D.C., for World Days Day last year in D.C., that's what I've seen. I've seen the same people at these events, and we need to find a way to get other people out to these events. <laughs> well, I guess I'm going to follow up with that question um, since I work kind of directly with all of you. Um, and it's really awesome to see you guys every week do the work that you do. Um, and I understand why you do the work that you do, and you've told them a bit about why. But why do you think we can't get more young people involved in the work that we do today or any youth service organization um, that's here in the district is trying to do? Like, how do we bring back the energy, the sexiness, uh, the act up that other groups had in the late 1980s and early 1990s? Great question. <laughs> so Spencer and I talked a little bit about this earlier, but um, I really think that as far, like when we watched the video, we seen like, you saw the growth of diversity over the years. So in the beginning, you saw a lot of white males, you saw a lot of the gay, lesbian, bisexuals, and then over the years, you will see that grow into more people of color, more women of color. So now, and that was, you know, because people started disclosing their status and things like that, and people were becoming more comfortable. But what we don't see now is young people disclosing their status, whether it's HIV or an STI. And so if young people aren't disclosing their status, they already believe that, you know, they aren't at risk, or if they are at risk, that they'll be able to deal with it. So if they, not, if they aren't seeing how they are affected by this, it's not going to be something that, you know, they really talk about or get so involved in um, 
working towards ending because they don't see how this affects them. So we just really need to, you know, figure out a way <laughs> to let them see how this does affect them. And this is something that I have a challenge with also because going into schools and talking, like I go into middle schools and some of the youth are really young and they're immature. So to even talk to them about sex or to talk to them about their bodies is just really hee hee to them. You know, they don't want to talk about it. They don't want to say the word penis. They're so young. So it's really trying to find a connection to see where they see how they fit into this, if that makes sense. Um, one idea that I have to get more youth involved would be to first um, destigmatize the idea of sex, like you said, a lot of kids. It's kids that's like younger than nine. I know for sure they are having some kind of sex, whether it's oral, vaginal, you know, what have you. So um, I think the first step would be to create a comprehensive sex education plan within DC public schools, within DC public charter schools, to have their own curriculum and things that they do, um, to help people feel more comfortable about these kind of subjects. Um, what else? Even like becoming involved. The only reason why I know about advocacy and activism was from um, other sad little um, programs that I was in. I was a mom in a parenting pro program where we did different things. So I think getting kids or teach them about the power in you know your voice and even in numbers um, would be like a start. Cause even the ride that we did yesterday, like it was a, enough of us out there, but. A lot of young people don't really feel like that's enough to get their voices heard or to even get the problem um, solved, you know, in the political system. Um, they don't even know the process to do, um, to make change. So I think that's where we need to start as far as education and things like that, to let them know how to get, you know, things resolved. So that's the start. I think that's where we should start. Um, I think that one thing that I always keep in mind when I want to get more people involved with prevention against the spread of HIV and AIDS and STDs, <laughs> being infected or learning about something like that, it doesn't have a face on it. It doesn't have a direct target audience. Anybody can be affected by this, right this now or in the future. So with that being said, it's just important to know about it. Because there's more ways to become a part of it than just sex. There's plenty of people who got it by accident. It's so easy to get it rather than you're under the influence. You can get it doing drugs. I mean, you can be tricked. So I think that it's just you know important to kind of understand that it's not about rather you've been you know immediately affected by it, but to be knowledgeable about it is. So much more powerful instead of waiting till it's too late and then trying to find out what you can find out. <laughs> okay, so how does activism play a role in the work that you guys do? And should it? You know what I think is the most the best answer for that question. I like I would say any non-profit organization. The group of people that you get to become activists are all different. And we all have different stories, different backgrounds, and different interests. So we affect different people. I would say, this is just, you might laugh, but I would say I'm more of an effective person on educating people about HIV and AIDS and preventing and spreading things and being safe when it comes to the nightlife. Because I'm always reminded my friends, okay, we're going out tonight, but you know, everybody's going to do this safely, everybody's going to do that safely, you know what I mean? Things like that. Z might be, you know, Z's um, mom, so Z might have a different approach on how she talks to her child, her child's friends. And then you have Chandler, Chandler's like, <laughs> <laughs> it just makes me laugh. 
but Chandler, you know, she has a different approach on how she goes about doing things. You have, you have somebody at school, January goes to the schools, I don't go to the schools, but, you know, that's not something that I think I'm good at. But everybody has something different to bring to the table. So I think that's definitely how we play a significant role in activism. Can you repeat the question? <laughs> <laughs> um, how does activism play a role in the work that you do and should? Um, uh, from experience, I know that activism plays an important part in the work that we do at Memphis Age. And as part of the Young Women's of Color Leadership Council, um, which is another peer education team at Mental Teen Aids, our prime, well, I wouldn't say our primary, because everybody does a little bit of what everybody does, but one of our focus is advocacy and going out, you know, to the Wilson Building to share our stories or to talk about different issues. And I know over the past couple of years, we um, worked on a condom availability act where condoms should not only be available in your nurse office, but maybe the curry out that you go to after school, or the barber shop that you go to a couple days a week, maybe not a couple days, but whenever you go to get your haircut, like condoms should be available in other places other than the school nurse. Some people don't, I, I never went to a school nurse, ever. Like never, ever. She was never there. So, <laughs> she really wasn't, like honestly. So, things like that, like those different projects that we worked on, even the comprehensive sex ed, like we had a, we played a part in that, um, like letting people know that, hey, you can't just preach abstinence only, like really, who is abstinent? And if they are, kudos to you, but we need to talk about abstinence and comprehensive sex ed, that's birth control, that's condoms, that's everything, being safe in any and everything that you do, so um, we need to keep doing it because it's a lot of more work than we need to do, but um, we've been doing it since day one. Um, I also work on the Young Women of Color of Leadership, Young Women of Color Leadership Council, but with Advocates for Youth. And so, uh, with Advocates for Youth, we actually have a petition out now <laughs> that is to create a National Youth HIV AIDS Awareness Day because youth, there are so many uh, HIV AIDS Awareness Day, but within those, there is one for you. And so, you are affected by this virus as well. So we want a day that is really um, focusing on youth. So maybe, you know, that can get youth ignited to want to join this movement as well, because then they can see, oh, there's a day for us. Oh, we're really aff affected by this. So if anybody is interested in signing that, <laughs> I have petitions with me. But um, we do a lot of activism as well. As you said, we go into, we have a lot of days. We are always uh, getting action alerts to call out our senators, call out our legislators, and to take action on issues that are, are affecting us as young people. So whether it's something like comprehensive sex ed, whether it's something like um, birth control being available in stores, whatever it is, we're taking action on that, and then we're also sharing it with our peers, whether or not they're involved in these programs that we're involved in, so that they can take action on it as well, because this is something that is also affecting them. So activism plays a great role, and if sharing stories is very important. So like they said, they go to the Wilson Building to share their stories. It's one thing to go and to talk to a legislator or a staffer, and talk about numbers, but if you don't put a face or a story behind that number, they're not going to remember it, and they're not going to, making change is not going to really, you know, matter to them, because they don't see the face or the story behind that number. So young people getting involved and sharing their stories and get, getting involved in this activism is really important. The more to that. Okay, uh, I want to talk a little bit about your thoughts on uh, something I really noticed when this down, especially compared to the work that we all do today. Um, like, look at images from the late 80s and early 90s, you can definitely see the visibility of the virus, whether someone's ill, you can see the symptoms, or folks are more easily disclosing their status because of the urgency. This is really life or death. Um, how does that impact the work that you all do today with 
HIV/AIDS and epidemic really becoming invisible, where it's become a chronic illness. We, and we talk about this all the time. You can live a long, healthy, sustained life. But how do we also engage youth specifically to protect themselves and their bodies and take action on this? Because it still is a political issue. So, how do we like make that less broad? <laughs> <laughs> You mean like, how do we get more youth involved in the political side of it? But how do we, how can we work better with young people when, at this time, there was so much urgency, the clock sticking on everyone's lives who was joining ACT UP and the work that they're doing. When we don't really have that urgency anymore, how do we still be successful at engaging youth to protect themselves, join the movement, uh, and really make a difference in their community, especially here in DC, where I just remember the poster of one in 61 people have HIV AIDS, where you're testing at one in 20. And especially one in five people don't know their status, which is a huge issue that we're all working on is having folks just know their status. Um, how do we better work with you when the epidemic is really invisible? We don't see it on the news anymore. We don't see our community really representing that. Well, you know, I honestly think that having somebody my age talk to me, like the peer educators that we do have, really embracing that, I think it works. Like, when, like, say somebody like, well, I was a little mother, but let's think, a teacher or math teacher, I don't like math. If my math teacher told me, oh, you better be safe, use condoms, you better be girl. You know what I mean? <laughs> but if my friend tells me, did you know, you know, this could happen if you do this, that, 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 I would take it a little bit more serious. Not just because it's my friend, but just because that's somebody that I obviously have some type of trust, companionship, or faith in. So, peer educators, that's a good idea. Like, <laughs> no, I, I really like the idea of somebody my age talking to me about something that's going on with my generation as opposed to somebody who's, you know, gone through this, that, and the other and is just telling me so it doesn't happen again. Not saying that that's how they're presenting it, but that's how I would think about it. I like their I think the urgency now is, to me, a better I think the urgency now is, like, it's not death, but it's more of prevention. So, like, if you can prevent yourself from contracting this, then do that, rather than contracting it and having to live with it and having to worry about keeping yourself healthy so you don't acquire AIDS and, you know, just let's focus on the, focus on the prevention piece more than the AIDS or HIV piece. We know that we can present, prevent ourselves from this. So how do we do it? And then the whole disclosure thing again. So like, we know that young people look around and they'll say, oh, well, they don't look like they got nothing, so I mean, I'm good. And that's their attitude. But if people, if young people, more young people would disclose their status, whether it be HIV, or an STI, and they can see that, you know, okay, well, you know, they are living with this, they are healthy, but this is what they're dealing with, and this is what they're going through, and if I can prevent myself from that, then I should just, you know, try my best to pre prevent myself from that. And then also, I know Z um, talked more earlier about, like, taboo. So there's a lot of taboo and stigma associated with prevention methods, such as condoms. There's a lot of stigma attached to condom use. There's a lot of stigma attached to getting tested for HIV. And so if there's all this stigma attached for becoming tested for HIV and using condoms, how can we really expect young people to prevent themselves from contracting these diseases when there's stigma attached to what it is that they need to prevent themselves from contracting it to? If that makes sense. So. It makes sense. Um, but I want to talk about the education piece because I'm all for education. Um, I think it should be like, you know, the comprehensive sex ed, when they talk about HIV, it should be like, they should show this the documentary that we just saw. Um, and how people's lives were back when this epidemic first, 
you know, popped on the scene. Um, because I think it would then like, you know, it had like I seen another version of the documentary, but it'll have people thinking like, wow, this is what people had to go through. Just like it's crazy that we, you know, the government has money. Why wow, like for issues that is really affecting a big population of people, it just doesn't make sense that they wouldn't want to do anything about it. But um what I, Yeah, it's just crazy. Um I also wanted to say So, okay, even though like people are living longer because the medicines have improved, people still need to realize that HIV and AIDS is still a problem. Like people are still getting affected every day. People are still dying every day. You can live longer. You may not see, you know, the cancer spasms <coughs> or see that they're losing massive weight, but people are still getting affected, and it can happen to any and everybody, no matter what you look like. People with AIDS don't look like they have cancer, or they look like me, and you, and you. So, we just need to let the young people, no, seriously, like, let them realize, like, just get them to realize, like, I don't know. So, um, Frederick Douglass once said that power concedes nothing without demand. And it, right here, one of the activists from ACT UP, Zoe Leonard, said, what AIDS revealed is not a problem with the virus. What AIDS revealed are the problems with our society. So I'm thinking about, you know, I kind of picked up what Aaron said about, in, about the political movement. What do you see as your role in the political movement to actually end this epidemic? We have her. Do you see yourself taking it to the streets? Do you see yourself fighting on Capitol Hill? Do you see yourself fighting at, the, at, the, at City Hall? What do you see as your role in the political movement to actually end this epidemic? So she said, be honest, right? <laughs> <laughs>